This is Ben Gertzel. I've just returned to Hong Kong from Sichuan province in mainland China, where I was talking to farmers and agricultural researchers and giving a talk on the application of AI to the diagnosis of crop disease and the prediction of the course of crop disease. The talk I gave in Sichuan wasn't video recorded, so now that I'm back home, I decided to record a version of the talk and uh, upload it. At least that will remind me in the future what it was I was talking about and maybe of some interest to other people as well. The event in Sichuan was the first international AI agritech seminar in Leshan City. Lashan is about an hour and a half out of Chengdu, the capital of Sichuan province. It's maybe three or four million population, which is a, which is a small city for China. Now, my interest in application of AI to diagnose crop diseases didn't begin in China. It began in Ethiopia. I co-founded in 2013 Ethiopia's first AI and robotics company, ICOG Labs, and in 2015, some of our undergraduate interns there prototyped an iPhone app, an Android phone app, that, that let you take a picture of a coffee leaf, and then the app would tell you what disease the coffee leaf had. And the app these students made used machine learning. It was based on a neural net that had been trained on pictures of coffee leaves to recognize the, the diseases the coffee leaves had. A year after that, in 2016, some researchers at Bardar University in Ethiopia published a paper doing something similar using image analysis for Ethiopian coffee plant disease identification. They made a prototype software system to this effect, which is, which is, is kind of interesting. And I talked to some folks in the Ethiopian government about rolling out this kind of application in practice, training better models, training on, on more and more diseases, figuring out what we need to do to transition this research prototype into something that really would be useful to farmers in reducing the amount of disease that their coffee plants experience. Now, those discussions with the Ethiopian government are still going on. In the, in the meantime, I thought it would be interesting to pursue the same idea elsewhere. And I made contact with some folks in Sichuan province through a company, Yanup, whose CEO I happened to meet here in Hong Kong. And through Yanup and the Sichuan province and Lishuan city government and the researchers and universities there, we seem to be progressing toward practical implementation of, of AI for predicting the course of, 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 of crop disease. And of course, if we can make this work in Sichuan, we can then port what we did there to, to Ethiopia and to, and to everywhere else. I began my talk in Lashan with some broader framing my good friend Ray Kurzweil and his book, the, uh, the, the Singularity is Near. And what's fascinating is these sorts of ideas about the impending technological singularity are now not considered as particularly outrageous or speculative by people like botany professors or government officials in Lashan, Sichuan province, China, the idea that more and more advanced technologies are, you know, pervading the world and taking over every industry and that AI is getting smarter and smarter and may eventually be even smarter than people. I mean, these ideas are now considered as reasonable by classes of people who, you know, five, ten years ago would have considered these outrageous science fictional speculations. People in Lashan, like people everywhere else, could see that AI is advancing rapidly. We have self-driving cars. We have software that can automatically label pictures with, uh, with 
words describing the contents of the, of, of the pictures. We have AI stock trading systems. But they could also see that agriculture, which is the, the main business around, around there in Lishuan and in Sichuan generally, agriculture is lagging behind and the applications of AI to agriculture are still mostly mostly non-existent and in, in, a, in a quite quite primitive state. So the audience that I spoke to in Lashan was fairly well disposed to believe the singularity is near and they, they wanted to see the singularity brought to to agriculture to help help their crops grow better, to help them get, get fewer diseases and to help them grow healthier food for everyone. After presenting basic concepts of the singularity, I talked a bit about things AI can do today, drive cars, play games, do su- supply chain optimization, hold, hold, hold conversations, help doctors diagnose diseases. I presented some of my work and concepts on, on AI, AGI, uh, OpenCog, Hanson Robotics, I won't summarize these things now because I already have plenty of talks online going over these topics. I then dug into the matter at hand. So I talked about some recent work using deep learning for image-based plant disease detection. And this, this work is interesting both because of its strengths and its, its weaknesses. So what, what these authors from Switzerland did is they they took a bunch of pictures of many different kinds of plants with many different kinds of of diseases and they trained deep learning vision recognition models to identify what disease the plant had from the picture of the leaf and one thing that was interesting here is Okay, they looked at 54,000 images, 14 species, 26 diseases. Now, when they use statistical methods to measure the accuracy of their deep learning algorithm, they, they got over 99% accurate. So what that means is, you know, they trained their deep learning model on some plant leaf images, then they tested the model on other plant leaf images, and on the test set, they got 99% plus accuracy, which is really good. On the other hand, when they evaluated the model on other pictures of diseased plant leaves that were different from their training or test set, they were like taken by other farmers in different lighting conditions with different cameras. Well, then what did they find? Well, then, then they found accuracy around 30%. Of course, random random on uh, that number, like 26 diseases, is, would be around 4% accuracy. So 30% is still pretty good, but it's not 99%. So what you see there is really a failure of generalization. It's a failure of, of transfer learning. You have models that are overfit, not necessarily to the training data, but to the whole type of data, which is in the training set and, and, and the test set. And this this indicates we need to inch a little further from narrow AI toward general intelligence to make a system that can really automatically diagnose crop diseases in the wild. Another paper I talked about was uh, identification of alfalfa leaf diseases using image recognition technology. And this study was a bit simpler. I mean, you see the diseased alfalfa leaves have big brown spots, and you can look at how big are the spots, what color are the spots, how many spots are there. And that's not an astoundingly hard task for modern image analysis technology. It's interesting to see how accurately you can you can identify diseases this way. In the end, it's not clear to me that the AI is doing something here that that farmers don't know how to do themselves, which is a which is a topic I'll I'll come back to in a moment. I also discussed in my talk the opportunity to apply some fancier deep learning technology, and then 
AI technology beyond deep learning, like OpenCog, with its probabilistic logic capability to the problem of diagnosing uh, disease from images of, of plant leaves. Talked about uh, InfoGAN, which is a fancy neural net algorithm that identifies sort of semantic parameters of images. So you show InfoGAN a bunch of chairs, and not only learns a neural net that can recognize what's a chair and what's not a chair, it learns that chairs can be rotated and they yield other chairs. Chairs can be wider or narrower. It learns the, the high-level semantic variables that characterize what a chair is. And if you apply info again to faces of celebrities, again, it learns that some celebrities have glasses, some don't. Celebrities can be happy or sad or angry. Celebrities can have different hairstyles. They can hold their faces at different angles. The interesting thing is no one told Infogan that glasses are a thing or emotion is a thing. It, it learns the semantic variables itself. I mean, it doesn't learn the word glasses or the word emotion, but it learns these these axes of, of variation. And that would be interesting in an agriculture context. I mean, if you applied Infogan to these images of alfalfa leaves, you expect it would learn that size of the splotch is a is a semantic variable number of splotches, color of the splotch, or semantic variables. And it would learn the key semantic variables characterizing the pictures of, of, of diseased plant leaves. In Sichuan, as well as attending a seminar, I went to six different farms to try to get a practical sense from the farmers of what kind of issues they were facing with, with, with crop diseases, because... Having been an academic myself, you know, I'm aware that sometimes you end up publishing papers on, you know, whatever is easiest to publish a paper on rather than on what is really the, the most pressing practical problem. So I really wanted to go to the, go to the source, go to the farmers and, and see what they thought was the, the real need they had for, for AI applications. So, I mean, th this farmer showed me some strawberries, is what they call white powder disease in Chinese. Chinese are sometimes very direct in, in naming things. So in his case, he didn't have a big problem with the disease identification. Like every year, many of his strawberries got white powder disease. He just wanted a, wanted a way to, to get rid of it, basically. Tea... You can see the brown leaves among the green ones are diseased, but there's many different types of disease, and they all kind of give discolored leaves, but it's not obvious to tell which is which. And tea is a tricky problem in terms of crop disease because you can't use pesticides on it unless they're super organic safe pesticides because you're... I mean, you're cooking the tea in some hot water and the flavor is, is depending very sensitive on any chemicals that, that are, that are in there. So for tea, they really need to identify what the disease is early so they can use some organic method to, to, to cure it. This, this tomato had an, an obvious issue. And one thing that was interesting with the tomatoes is that you could have a disease in a certain row of tomato plants and it won't always spread to the next row of, of tomato plants. So the farmers tended to apply the, the pesticide just to those plants that had had the disease or whose neighbors seemed to have the disease. Still, though, it was common among the farmers we talked to that they would over-apply pesticides out of an abundance of caution. So, like, we don't know what diseases our plants are going to get this year, so let's take every possible pesticide and dump it across our crops and hope for the best. And let's do that over and over again. And, of course, this is not good for the health of the people eating the produce, and it's not really what the Chinese government wants, but you see why the farmers end up doing that, because, I mean, the pesticides cost them a bunch of money, but on the other hand having crops that are diseased and they can't sell. I mean, that costs them even more money. That costs them their, their livelihood.
we visited a number of different, you know, agri stores, as, as they call them, which sell animal, farm animal food and also plant food and, and fertilizer. And the agri stores are where the farmers buy pesticides. And this is, in some ways, the best entry point for advanced technology into the agriculture ecosystem because. A farmer to buy a pesticide in China needs to register with the government that they're buying the pesticide because the government wants to control and minimize use of pesticides. So what Yanup, the company that, that I'm working with on this, is doing is selling an ERP system to these agri stores. And the ERP system does basic accounting and record keeping and identity management, but Hey, we can also integrate machine learning into it to do all sorts of data mining and help identify crop disease from images and, and, and other data. So by working with these agri stores where the farmers go to get pesticides and plant food and so forth, we can integrate AI technology into the ERP software being used at, at, at the store, which is going to be easier than getting farmers to use AI technology extensively, although farmers certainly are more than willing to take pictures of crop leaves with their, with their phone using, using an app, since, that, since they, all have, they all have smartphones. The agri-store is where all this data can get aggregated and where it can be used to drive decision-making about pesticide uh, allocation to farmers and who really needs what what pesticide we visited one farm which is fairly modern and scientifically instrumented they could control the moisture and and water and nutrients and so forth electronically and i mean that they have a computerized uh, monitoring and and control system and they they can watch from the control room what's happening everywhere in the farm and look at various indicators of what's happening in the farm. So one thing we thought about is using this sort of well-instrumented farm as a test area and gathering a bunch of training data for AI algorithms to diagnose crop disease from, from that particular farm, which seemed able to run scientifically controlled experiments. Overall, the conclusions I drew from these conversations with the farmers in Lashan were that unlike what you might think from academic literature, the core issue faced by farmers often isn't identifying what disease their crops have. They often know because the crops often get the same diseases over and over. The issue is really understanding the course of the disease. Like, there's a little bit of white powder on these strawberries. Are they really going to all get sick? Will, a, will a, a nice organic pesticide work here? Do I need a nasty pesticide? How many times do I need to apply the nasty pesticide? Is this organic or, or more toxic pesticide actually actually working? And it seems that the answers to these types of questions... They're not entirely contained in the images of the plant leaves, although the images are useful. Other context variables are important, like what kind of soil is there? Is it, is it, is it rocky? Is it dry? What's the weather been like that year? What's it habitually like? What has the weather been like in previous years? What diseases have there been on that farm and on nearby farms that year and in previous years? So... I mean, analyzing images of diseased leaves, which is where we started, is part of the story. It's not really enough of the story. You need richer contextual data to feed into your AI for it to really make prediction of the, of the course of disease. So, I mean, on an AI level, one thing you can do, you can analyze images of leaves using Infogan or something, which will get like high-level semantic variables characterizing the leaf image. You could feed those high-level semantic variables alongside variables about the soil, weather, pesticide use, history, and other context conditions. Feed them all into some symbolic regression algorithm like OpenCog's MOSES or CMAES, Covariance Matrix Evolutionary Strategies. In that way, you could try to make an algorithm, learn a model that will predict 
disease the disease course and I mean of course you could get even fancier than that you could use open cogs PLN logic algorithm to generalize and extrapolate I mean what you could do with something advanced like PLN is take a model about one kind of plant and extrapolate it to a totally different kind of plant I mean there's there's no reason you can't do that but there's a bunch of steps to go through first we need to build somatic models of crop disease from images, we need to make models that incorporate the semantics of the images of diseased plant leaves with contextual variables about the overall conditions on, on, on the farm. Once we've done that, then we have basic models for predicting the course of disease, which can be fed into an abstract reasoning engine that can hopefully generalize and generalize from one kind of plant to another and maybe even generalize to new diseases that haven't been seen before when they when they emerge and you can get a little more futuristic here also i mean this this is about you know managing when do you use how many pesticides or what pesticides when can you use an organic pesticide but wouldn't it be nice just to get rid of the need for these pesticides uh Altogether, I mean, what one approach here is is lab-grown food, which is really interesting. But another approach is, you know, good old-fashioned genetic engineering of crops. So, I mean, if if you had a farmer not only upload an image of the diseased plant leaf to the computer in the in the agri store for integrated analysis, but also sometimes give a sample of the diseased plant leaf. I mean, these samples could be sent off for genetic analysis, and then you could form a map of the DNA of, you know, all the different strawberries, all the different tomatoes, all the different tea leaves, and which DNA patterns correspond to resistance to which kinds of diseases, which DNA patterns correspond to plants for which the pests on them can be gotten rid of by healthy organic pest treatments and so forth. This would guide experimental evolution and genetic engineering of, of better plants that didn't need pesticides in the first place. So that's, uh, yeah, that's what I discussed in Lashan with an interesting group of farmers, agri-store owners, plant doctors, and agriculture professors set up by Yanoop, which is an ERP software company making software aimed at farmers, at agri stores, and other actors in the agriculture ecosystem. All in all, this was a rapid, fairly deep dive into an application area I really didn't know a lot about before, but I came out of it thinking that, you know, agriculture is really ripe for application of advanced AI technologies, both deep learning and also abstract machine reasoning and probably going beyond that as well. The main issue at the moment really is gathering appropriate data. I mean, unlike say Facebook has billions of people's faces online, there's no leaf book, which has a such a diversity of images of leaves at various levels of health and sickness and various ages and various climates and so forth. So gathering more and more data, both image data and other biological data about the context on farms, gathering that data to feed the AI algorithms will be very important and is, is perhaps the biggest bottleneck in, in pursuing these types of agricultural applications. But I mean, the good news is the folks I talked to in Lashan were excited about gathering this data and could really see the potential that, that, that AI holds for this type of, of application. I think this sort of thing is really important to pursue both for proximal and indirect reasons. I mean, the proximal reason is we all eat food, right? I mean, after after working on very abstract AI theory and trying to build 
you know, a blockchain-based decentralized AI marketplace called SingularityNet and make OpenCog into a human-level and super-level intelligent system. After working on that, you know, I go to the supermarket and I buy fruits and vegetables that may be treated with unpleasant pesticides that will shorten my lifespan even as I'm working on the application of AI to expand human health span, right? So we all eat food, and if we can use AI to make our food healthier by reducing the need for nasty pesticides, that's that's a good thing in a direct way. It's also a good thing in an indirect way in terms of the politics of AI and the the real and perceived relationship between AI and the human condition in general. I mean, there's a lot of people worried that AI is going to take everyone's jobs or, or kill everybody or do this or that other nasty thing. And while we can't rule out such possibilities entirely, we can minimize the odds of such things coming to pass by making sure that the early stage AIs we create are doing positive, benevolent, and helpful things for humanity. So applying AI to medical research, education, elder care, scientific discovery, or agriculture, all these are ways to apply AI to positive things, which both ensures that people see AI in a positive light, and additionally, it biases the AI to grow up in a in a vibe of helping people and improving human life. I would rather the first AIs be, you know, doctors, scientists, or teachers or farmers, helpers, than have the first AIs be, oh, for example, killer robots. Anyway, that's uh, what I talked about in Sichuan province with a few uh, random embellishments and and uh, additions and I will uh, update in future when as I hope this project uh, really gets started and we are we are using AI to help uh, diagnose crop disease. This is a collaboration of uh, Yanup, a Chinese ERP company. OpenCog, SingularityNet, and uh, Moza, which is a, a Hong Kong and Shenzhen-based bioinformatics company I, I co-founded. And by bringing all these organizations and the researchers associated together, I'm hoping we can uh, do some amazing things for food in China and around the world and for, for generally uh, creating AI that's benevolent in a really practical down-to-earth sense.